I know this is everyone's favorite topic, uh, not controversial at all. So I'm going to talk about SI joint fusions. And just out of curiosity, how many people have actually done one? All right. And uh, you know the, the trick with SI joint fusions, I'm a neurosurgeon. It's an area of the anatomy that we never got in training. So I had to kind of learn what are the danger zones, what did I need to know to do the operation safely and who to pick. Um, I'm not going to go over that today. Really what I'm going to go over is what's the new evidence for it uh, and also how do you pick the right patient in which to do it on. Because I think that's the key with any surgery, especially in newer surgeries, is identifying the correct patient in which to do this on. Um, I am a consultant for SI Bone. Uh, I do their uh, uh, master's courses where I uh, go to the teaching, so I always give that as a caveat. All my other disclosures have to do with my, I'm a neurovascular surgeon, so they have nothing to do with this talk. So I'm gonna go over these uh, six basic things. What is the SI joint? Uh, can it cause pain, or is this something that someone's made up? How do I diagnose uh, how to, uh, how to uh, find the problem? How do I fix it? Most importantly, how can I mess it up? You know, what's the danger zones? Where, where can I get into trouble? And finally, actually show me some patients that have gotten better. Uh, so I'm gonna end, end with that. Uh, so what's the anatomy of the joint? It's a very complex joint. It's one of the biggest joints in the body, if not the biggest. And uh, where it's located is between the ala of the sacrum uh, and the, um, uh, the ischium. And what we find with this is, let's see if this point, is this point at all, Jeff? No, no pointing. Okay. Uh, so essentially, the body of the sacrum is where the best bone is. So anytime we talk about ways to fuse or fixate the joint, we have to really concentrate on the body of the sacrum. And as we talk about where the implants go with any of the devices, the best bone is in that articular surface, which is highlighted in yellow. Now, this is a change. When we first started doing SI joint fusions, people were staying towards that posterior segment because they felt safe. It's in the sacrum, you can't damage anything, so they would tend to go posterior. What they found was that you didn't get that good bony purchase, especially where that blue is, and going posterior, there's a big, thick ligamentous complex, and you tend to fixate in there, and it's never as strong as if you go anteriorly. There's that ligamentous complex. Probably where the pain comes from, uh, quite frankly, car accidents uh, cause it, cause disruptions, pregnancy causes laxity, uh, falls in the buttocks uh, can cause uh, problems with these ligaments. It's a very rich network that stabilizes the joint. When we talk about danger zones, we have to remember there's only three nerves that are potentially at risk. L5, which was anterior, uh, highlighted there in the yellow. So as we talk about where we put our placement of our pins or our screws, that's what we have to know where that is. Other ways you can mess it up, bleeding. Uh, you know, the pelvis is a strange area for neurosurgeons to get into, so you may not know anything that's in that area. Orthopedic surgeons probably have at least some, some exposure to this area. Superior gluteal nerve, or superior gluteal artery is the only vascular supply that's in danger there. Typically, it's a branch of it that's in the way. If you use a blunt technique like you use with a lateral uh, fusion, you can help avoid damaging any of these arterial uh, vessels. The joint. How does it move? It's a very strange motion. It's called a nutation. It's like a slight nodding. In the center of that rotation is the S1 foramen. So when we talk about ways to fixate or fuse the joint, you have to remember to be on both sides of the point of rotation, and that's your strongest way to mobilize the joint. In men, the joint moves about one to two degrees. In women, two to four. So it's not a big movement. You know, I, what I tell patients, it's kind of like an earthquake. The earth doesn't shift a mile, but a lot of force is released. And that's the best way to think of the SI joint. A lot of force is translated through that keystone joint versus the, the other joints in the lower back. The fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves as we try to fix it is, does it actually cause pain? Uh, for neurosurgeons, I was like, I don't know when I started. If you ask any pain doctor, the answer is an absolute yes. They see tons of these patients. Physiatrists see tons of these patients. They never sent them to surgeons because we didn't have a solution for them, and they would hang on to them forever. I have patients that have had uh, I think my record is 145 SI joint injections over 35 years. Uh, and I mean, I don't know if they had a joint left. It was so, you know, with all that story that went in there, but it was crazy. Uh, and so the pain doctors are big believers in it because they treat it and deal with it on a daily basis. Uh, you can't damage it. You know, that's, that's the, uh, the main uh, point with this is with the ligamentous complex laxity, either with disruption from trauma or laxity from pregnancy, you can cause damage to it. Obviously, patients that have ankylosing spondylitis uh, or spondyl arthropathies can actually autofuse the SI joint. Uh, before it fuses, they can complain of SI joint pain. 
Otherwise, the joint itself does not ankylose over time for most patients. It's highly innervated. Once again, if I go back to the pain docs and I ask them, you know, what's the, how do you guys treat these SI joints? Number one, they do injections. Number two, they'll do L5 through S3 lateral branch blocks to see if they can do an RF ablation for this. There's a huge, rich network uh, that goes to this area coming off of those uh, lateral branches. Uh, L5 to S, uh, S3 is the typical, typical areas that they uh, shoot for. So, there we go. I'm gonna, I have, I think, uh, 85 slides, so I'm gonna shoot through a couple of these so you guys don't have to uh, pay attention to them. Now, the most important one is how prevalent it is, is this pain? And as a neurosurgeon, before I looked for these patients, the answer was zero. I've never seen SI joint pain, what are you talking about? You know, maybe one patient, you know, in my lifetime I've seen with it. Once I started testing every patient with low back pain that came into my office, I found it a lot more. It wasn't necessarily their primary cause, but they would always have this pain and they would point right to it. They'd point, it hurts right here. And it would always be off the midline, over, always over their PSIS, so I started paying attention. If you look at the data, about 25 to 43% of patients that have symptomatic lower back pain have SI joint pain. May not be their primary cause. And this goes back to, you know, when I, when I tell people, well, SI joint can cause pain, they say, well, in my 35 years, I've never seen it. And I think it's because we never really looked. And we would have persistent pain after laminectomies, microdisc, fusions, and we would equate it to, well, it's failed back or, you know, it's some facet thing that we can't get rid of. And they probably had a big component. There's been a number of papers which are outlined up here, ranging from 32 to 43 percent uh, of symptomatic post-lumbar fusion pain comes from the SI joint pain, from the SI joint. Uh, this goes along with adjacent segment degeneration. We see this in cervical spine. We see this in lumbar spine. You fuse the lumbar spine, that stress goes somewhere. Inferiorly, that's your SI joint. You actually have increased angular motion and increased joint stress proven biomechanically in the SI joint after a lumbosacral fusion if you don't include the pelvis. So how do you find these patients? I can tell you that it happens, you know, 25% of all low back pain, but if you've never seen it, how do you really find this patient? The toughest part about the SI joint, there's a bit of a leap of faith. I don't have an imaging test I can give you that says, aha, there's a problem. With a herniated disc, I can point to a disc. With a spinal anesthesis, I can say that's causing their back pain. With the SI joint, there's not a definitive test radiographically. So that's a bit of a leap of faith you have to take when you rule out other things, that it can cause pain, but I can't see it. And that's where we'll get into how you actually see it without radiographs. The other problem is it overlaps a lot. L4-5 pathology and SI joint pathology looks very similar. And an L5 nerve root impingement and someone has L4-5 uh, you know, spinal arthropathy can look just like an SI joint and you can get easily confused. It's a very similar pattern. And so you have to rule out these uh, these confounding things is L5 pathology is a heck of a lot more common uh, than SI joint problems. So this is a diagnostic algorithm I use. Essentially when the patient tells me I can't sit for a long time, they say I was in a car accident, I had four pregnancies, I ski and I, and I fall all the time. Um, you know, I was a gymnast and I kept landing on my butt off the, off the uh, uh, pommel horse or whatever. That, that clues me in, or if they have problems going up and down stairs or transitional movements, going from sitting to standing, that clues me in that they have something going on with their SI joint. I still want to rule out their lumbar spine because that's 75% of these patients anyways. Uh, their hip, I also want to rule out because that's about 5% of these patients. So that's that 25% uh, left, that's the SI joint. To me, one of the most sensitive history questions is asking the patient where it hurts and having them point to it. Uh, I can't count how many times I've asked a patient, you know, can you point to where it hurts? And they'll be like, oh, it hurts back here. I'm like, no, turn around and point to where it hurts. And they'll turn around, lift up their shirt, and point right at their SI joint, right at their PSIS. And it's, it's very diagnostic. Like, you're the first person that's ever asked me to actually point and show me where it hurts. And so I find that is a very strong predictive value of whether they're going to have problems. Then on physical exam, I want to stress the joint, just like I would stress a knee for an ACL tear or an elbow. I want to stress the joint to see, can I reproduce the symptoms? Finally, the last one is really the gold standard. I want to numb the joint. If I numb that joint and 75% or greater of their pain goes away, that's a pretty good indication that a majority of their pain is coming from that area. 
There's one caveat to that that I'll show you when I go over the injection uh, based on anatomy and joint disruption that can throw you off. Uh, and I think that's sometimes where there's some confusing patients that um, you know, become outliers that we'll go over. But really, these are the two things I talked about. There's traumatic, which are typically MBAs, typically rear end car accidents, uh, childbirth, uh, the pregnancy and the ligamentous laxity that results. I practice in Bellevue, so it's lifting and twisting while playing squash or tennis. That's what everyone has complaints of, uh, the SI joint pain, typically in older men, which is different than the general population that has SI joint problems, which is almost three to one female to male uh, is the ratio typically because of the pelvic shape in women being more flat and greater ligamentous laxity. I've seen one patient from a um, iliac crest bone graft combined with navigation where they put the large pin through the SI joint and took a big graft off of it that had some instability. Uh, that's pretty rare, but that can also happen, especially uh, in older patients that had a, a iliac crest bone graft many, many years ago where large chunks were taken out of. So I asked the patient, when did your pain start? Well, I fell on my butt, or it feels like I'm pregnant again, and I haven't been pregnant in 30 years. So these are the sort of questions that let me know that the patient has a good history. When I ask them, what's your most painful position? With lumbar spine, it tends to be movement. Or when they first lay down and all the muscles of the, the paraspinal muscles relax and the, and the facets lose their support. With SI joint patients, it's almost always sitting. I can't sit in a car and drive across the 520 bridge. You know, I can't sit in the car for more than 15 minutes. As I'm seeing them in my office, they have that butt cheek raised because they don't want to sit on that side. So it's pretty pathognomonic when I start seeing patients in that uncomfortable position where it's unilateral um, that I start thinking, or oh, could the SI joint be involved? Also transitional movements, going from that sitting to standing, going up and down stairs waking up at night because they can't sleep on their left side because it reproduces their symptoms. These are all uh, you know, clues that it could be their SI joint. What usually makes them feel better is actually sleeping on the contralateral side uh, or actually standing up. You know, as opposed to my lumbar facet patients where standing or walking usually makes them worse, these patients can feel better while doing that. Uh, this is that referral pattern that looks awfully lot like an L5 you know, uh, pattern now the groin pain is interesting. So when I see a male patient with groin pain, I think it's their hip until proven otherwise. I've seen a number of SI joint patients that have a searing groin pain, male and female. And it, there's an overlap with the hip that you have to uh, rule out uh, that I find in those patients. This is that Ford and finger test. I don't have to be that smart to know where it hurts. They point to it. They point right at their PSIS and says it hurts right there. Because of the overlapping pain patterns, I want to make sure I really examine the lumbar spine because that's, like I said, 70-75% of these patients. I really want to check out their facets. Uh, I want to look at their flexion extension, see if that reproduces their symptoms. What I actually have in my office is a step, and I have them step up with the affected side. And it's almost pathognomonic watching them. They'll step up with that side, and they'll like kind of throw themselves up versus on the good side, they'll step up very easily. So that's a, another good way that you can tell that their SI joint is affected. I'll do the neural tension test, of course, you know, straight leg raise, that's passive. That's checking for neural tension. An active straight leg raise will check for SI joint pain because they'll have to activate a lot of the pelvic floor muscles and the piriformis, and it can reproduce their symptoms. Go forward here. Um, the hip test we'll skip over. The SI joint test, uh, these ones I talked about, which is sitting to standing, reproducing symptoms, going up on a step, reproducing symptoms, active straight leg raise. There's five provocative tests that have been shown from anywhere from 75 to 81% sensitivity and specificity, that if you have three out of five of these that cause SI joint pain or pain over your PSIS, that you will respond to a diagnostic injection and that this is the cause of your symptoms. Uh, these tests are five different motions of the SI joint, going from the nutation of Ganslin to a compression, distraction, a forced abduction, external rotation, and a thigh thrust. And you wanna do these tests for two reasons. One, to show the patient has the problem. Uh, and two, sometimes more importantly, if you think they have a problem, they respond, you have to do these tests to get it authorized by insurance. I'm sure the company hates when I say that, but that's very important that you do these tests on these patients. So you have a patient, they have SI joint pain, 
their history says, you know, I slipped on ice, fell on my butt, I got pain right here. You do your provocative test, three out of five or five out of five are positive. So what do you do next? You want to make sure that they have SI joint pain. At this point, it's still not proven because I don't have imaging. I can't say do a flexion extension x-ray, uh, you know, do a uh, CT myelogram. There's really no test. So this is that 91 to 76% specificity and sens sensitivity I told you about. So next, you want to do an injection. And when you block the joint, they should get very quick symptomatic relief. Uh, because I have access to a biplane, I was doing my SI joint injections myself for a period of time. Within 10 seconds of a block, they feel a difference. Right there on the table, I push on their SI joint as hard as I can before the injection. They'll give me a rating. I'll push right after I'm done. I'll count to 10, push on it, and I will bounce them on the table. And they're like, I don't feel it now. For the ones that will respond to going further on in the process. If they don't get relief with that, they're not going to respond, I think, to surgical management in my, in my experience. So that intraarticular injection is key. Always have to inject contrast to make sure you're intraarticular. The reason for that is, is, is in this picture. That last uh, panel, number D, that shows you how far anterior of the sacrum the SI joint goes. It's not at the anterior sacral line. It's well anterior to that. It's a huge joint. Now, when you do an injection in pain C, it looks kind of like a bat wing. The reason that's important, right at that anterior surface of that bat wing is where your L5 nerve root is running. If you inject contrast under AP or lateral, or under um, uh, AP only, you're not gonna see that picture. And if there's an anterior joint disruption, which they can have pain from, that contrast runs anteriorly. But when you inject a block, you're blocking the L5 nerve too. So they could get better. So you always wanna make sure, or I always wanna make sure I have a lateral shot with my injections so I know that I won't have these patients. It happens rarely, but that's one of the confounders I found is when they inject the contrast on that lateral, you'll see it run anteriorly with an anterior joint disruption, which means they could be getting a benefit from an L5 block, even though you're sticking in their SI joint. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. <laughs> Um, RFA has been shown to uh, help with SI joint pain. Unfortunately, it's only for six months. Uh, after that, the results go way down. And the benefits are, you know, as I say, constrained by nerve regeneration by six months to a year. So now you have a patient that you've tried these conservative measures, you've sent them off to physical therapy for six months, they've done pelvic floor exercises, they've had injections. What do you do with that patient at this point? Well. The old days, or I guess some people used to do, they're open SI joint fusions. Uh, there's uh, two big schools that used to do them, uh, one out of uh, Atlanta uh, with Dr. Lippitt, where they would stick in two small screws across the SI joint and try to fixate it that way. The belief with that was from the orthopedic trauma literature where you can get some compression, like you get with a pelvic ring disruption. Uh, the disadvantage was that it had about a 40 to 60% success rate for improvement of symptoms any improvement. It could have been one point, it could have been eight points. Uh, so a lot of people have fell out of favor because it was about a five to 600 cc blood loss going anteriorly. It was a big open operation with about a two week hospital stay. So people kind of went away from that until MIS SI joint fusion uh, became at least a reasonable solution uh, for these patients, especially at first when we didn't have studies, now we do, which I'll go over. It's really approved for two things, SI joint disruption and degenerative sacroiliitis. What is SI joint disruption in a non-trauma patient? Uh, you know, we've kind of defined it as when you do a contrast injection during your block, that contrast leaves the joint. Uh, so we've called that an SI joint disruption uh, for the purposes of this FDA clearance. Uh, there's a lot of devices available, uh, different angles. Some are screws that are compressive. Some have a intraarticular fusion mechanism. Some are bone plugs. Some are screws. Some are uh, rods. Um, and some come in at different angles. So there's, I think, now about 16 different companies that make a SI joint fusion tool. Uh, there's some newer devices that are coming out that are 3D printed. Uh, you know, these uh, offer you know, the benefits the country, uh, the company will tell you that they offer, but there are some newer generation of devices coming out, which I think are very important as we go forward in treating this. Uh, it shows you the difference in the surface area available for a fusion across the joint. But if you really think about it, you're putting an implant through the ilium into the sacrum into where you would do a bone marrow aspiration from. These implants, no matter what you use, are bathed in bone marrow aspirate. 
Uh, you know, the lack of fusion in these things is, is pretty rare, uh, though it does happen at a very low rate, which I'll go over. Uh, so what's the clinical evidence? I could tell you, you know, this is great, you know, this works, but the, this is one of the few things I do that actually now has quite a bit of clinical evidence. There's 53 papers uh, as of May uh, that look at this, including seven randomized controlled trials. Uh, that's more than a lot of other things that we do. Uh, looking from everything from the randomized controlled trial to cost effectiveness uh, and loss of productivity by not doing it. Uh, these are a couple of the, uh, unfortunately, they're all from one company, but, and they are uh, industry uh, sponsored. However, they are randomized controlled trials looking at non-operative and <coughs> operative management of SI joint pain. Uh, I'm going to go over the first one uh, in a little more detail, uh, which is called the INSIGHT trial. Uh, disclaimer, I was a participant in the trial, um, so, you know, I have that bias. However, in the trial, it looked at non-surgical management and minimally invasive SI joint fusion. It was a two to one randomization. Twice as many got fused as got non-surgical treatment. There was a six month crossover that was allowed uh, in that trial. And this was the results. So what's interesting is with the SI joint fusion minimally invasively, there was a six point drop in the patient's VAS from an average of about eight to down to a two. In the patients that had non-surgical management, they did not improve. And if they crossed over, they improved with surgery. So it didn't matter if you did the surgery early or late, they still showed that same improvement, and it lasted till two years. So up to two years, they had an improvement, and it was uh, uh, durable. Likewise with their Oswestry Disability Index, once again, a big drop from 60 to 24. Durable at two years. So looking at it, you had an improvement in the uh, patient satisfaction, improvement in VAS, improvement in ODI. Most importantly, opioid use went down 30% in those patients. You know, there's a huge opio opioid uh, crisis right now, and these patients started using less. Uh, and that was, that's one of the first studies to show reduction in the use of those agents in any recent study that I've seen out there. Uh, in terms of, well, what's, how, did, how could you mess it up? What was the complication rate? There's a total of 22 events uh, of which really, of those 22 events, uh, the, the main one was three patients had a revision surgery by two years. So three out of essentially 176 patients had a revision surgery. Compare that to any other spine surgery that you do. Pretty good numbers, at least in my, at least in my practice. You guys are probably better than me, but... Uh, so at two years, these patients did so much better than non-surgical management, and the ones that crossed over did better than non-surgical management. So that's important to note, that even the late surgery patients did better. Uh, Sci-Fi was a prospective multi-center trial, also going out to two years, exact same results. SI joint pain improved, ODI improved, and it was durable 24 months. Well, you could say, well, is 24 months enough time to really look at, you know, at this problem? So uh, as more and more papers came out, now we've gone out to 60 months, five-year data. That's a, all those color-coded uh, things. There are all the papers that have been published on SI joint uh, that are randomized, controlled, or prospective. And up till five years, and in one paper, 72 months or six years, improvement in VAS for the SI joint sustained to six years. That's one surgeon's experience, so you know, there's that caveat, but that's better than a lot of the studies that I have for a lot of the other things that I do. So that's important to note, it's a durable result. Uh, likewise, reduction in disability, there was Westry Disability Index, massive improvement, sustained. Uh, you know, as a cover of the um, uh, Neurosurgery Journal about eight months ago, 10 months ago, uh, because they did so much better. Likewise, patients are super happy with the surgery. They feel so much better. I can say it's placebo, but 91% is a patient satisfaction average if I look at every single paper. If you look at just the prospective papers, it's 91%. There's some papers I have at 100%. Uh, my personal uh, number is 95%, uh, and I'll, I'll go over that in my case studies at the end, but it's amazing how happy these patients are. I think a lot of the time, it's, there is a placebo effect that's, that goes into it, but they have a structural difference. And it's because their pain has been ignored for so long. And everyone said, well, I don't have a solution. And so they just kind of hung out, hung out until they finally had someone that said, I'll validate your pain and try to fix it. And I think they also get better from that as well. Revision rate, four years, three and a half percent. 
that's pretty darn good for any spine surgery that I can think of. That's a, that's a very low. And in fact, I put up lumbar decompression from Deo's paper, 10 to 12%, uh, lumbar fusion, 12 to 14% decomp uh, uh, revision rates uh, at four years. So it's a pretty survivable uh, uh, surgery. Looking at six years, if you look at the uh, six year mark, they had a six point drop in their VAS for their SI joint. I mean, think about that with your lumbar fusion patients. That's a pretty big difference in those patients. Uh, and if you look at the very first portion of this graph, it shows one week after SI infiltration. These patients really responded to SI joint injections. So they were really pre-selected for the ones that would improve. There's probably some patients that get SI joint injections that don't improve, that could benefit from surgery. But I always encourage not to do those until you get a lot of evidence showing that you get this durable uh, effect. When you do the surgery, there's very few things you can do to mess it up, and I'm going to go over all of them. Uh, the number one thing that you can do is understand anatomical variations, because there's only three nerves at risk. The L5 nerve, the S1 nerve, and the S2 nerve. That's it. So if you know where those are in all of your views, you can avoid your danger zones. There's only one blood vessel at risk, a branch of the superior gluteal artery. If you know where that is and use blunt dissection, not an issue. So short of that, there's no bladder there, there's no uh, intestines there. And that was kind of my fear as a neurosurgeon going into this area is like, oh, there's gonna be all this stuff I don't wanna get into. We've all had experience with other devices that maybe go transrectally, you know, that cause uh, injuries to uh, structures uh, in that area. And this is nowhere near that area. So that's an important thing to remember. Uh, male and female sacrums in ALA are different. Uh, we know that. And this is why I get a CT. So here's a CT. <coughs> Uh, two different CTs on two different patients that show the difference. The one on the right, you can see the SI joint has a good surface all the way from top to bottom. Now, if you're putting something across that, that's a much shorter distance in which to get a fixation. If you look at the other sacrum, there's big gaps. So if you're sticking something through that gap, you have to trust that it's going to fuse across that gap. And that's a much different sacrum between those two patients. And I, I'd be cautious about the one on the right, on the uh, left side of the screen for you guys about doing that patient because of that gap. I might do that one open. Uh, likewise, um, this one on the bottom shows a dysmorphic sacrum. If you look at the top picture, in the top picture, you have a pretty good interface between the bone. How, where are you going to put that bone? Where's the sacrum? So you're going to put something across the joint. You have a very small window in which to hit. So you always want to get a preoperative CT because you will miss this on an x-ray. You do a lateral x-ray and AP, there's enough bone in that area that you won't see this. So CT is very important to look for that danger zone. Likewise, you know, with this picture, they have this weird bone island. You know, and if you would have no idea on an x-ray that they have that. Uh, and so getting a CT is very important to avoid those danger zones. This is what I was talking about with bone quality. The bottom one is an osteopenic patient. Look at that sacrum. That has much better bone, even in an osteopenic patient, than that lateral bone. So when we put in implants, we really want to get them into here because that's where the high quality bone is. That's what's going to prevent that pseudoarthrosis. So I want to show a couple uh, cases. Um, I don't like to show, like, look at me now cases. I'm going to show cases that I learned a lesson from. And, and uh, so I, that's, I always give that caveat uh, because I think it's important to know where things can go wrong or what to look for. So I've done about 125 cases, wide age range, uh, mainly females. I've asked all the patients would they do the surgery again. 122 out of 125 said yes. Uh, the three that said no, I asked them why. One had a prominent implant and felt as though their glute was hitting it, so they had persistent pain. Uh, one had improved pain but still had SI joint pain, said, well, I don't know if it was worth it. And the last one uh, had a revision surgery where they removed the inferior implant, but they got no better. Uh, so those are the only three that have said no out of 125. First patient, 77-year-old uh, male. Uh, he's a retired urologist uh, from the Army. Uh, he played a lot of racket sports, played tons of squash, and developed this SI joint pain. Uh, it started in his right lower back, right over his PSIS, right into his buttocks. He said, I can't sit more than five minutes. And, you know, he's a beekeeper. He likes to ride bikes. He goes, I want to go ride a bike, but I can't sit on my bike for more than five minutes before I have to stop. Uh, his son's one of the ER docs at my hospital and sent him to me for an L45 uh, T lift. That was, the, that was actually the referral, L45 T lift, as if that was going to fix him. So when I saw him, I said, well, where's your pain? He goes, it hurts right here. 
So, well, you know, what causes your pain? Uh, really just sitting. You know, if I walk, I feel great, but if I sit, it really hurts. Uh, and so I sent him for an injection. Uh, I did the, the test, uh, the provocative test, three out of five were positive. That's a CT. His SI joint had this sort of, you know, hyperostosis around it, it just looked kind of degenerative, but there wasn't anything obvious uh, on that. Uh, he got an injection, he got 100% pain relief. So I said, well, why don't you go back and get another injection? This was back in 2012. I just started doing the procedure. Uh, and he had a, he, was, he goes, listen, you know, I'm a doctor. Stop bullshitting me. Just fuse it. And I said, okay. You know, I mean, as long as you understand that. Uh, so this was, I think, my third case. Um, back then, I wanted to be on both sides of the S1 frame. And I put in two implants. Took about 40-ish minutes to do the surgery. I've changed my weight-bearing guidelines over time. Back then, I did uh, six weeks at 50% weight bearing. Uh, and so we did that. And I saw him at 12 months, and I just saw him at 24 months uh, a couple of years ago. He had about a 50% reduction in his pain. So not 100%, but now he's able to cycle 100 miles per week. So he's happy. He's like, you know, I, you know, I still have some irritation, but now I can do the things I wanted to do. Uh, at one year follow up, implants look great. Uh, in retrospect, as I told you guys earlier, the best bone is up here. Back when we first started doing it, because we didn't know, like, there's a, there's a safety profile up here that we weren't that familiar with, we used to put a more posterior. So my lesson from this is now, had I done this, I would have put a third implant, but my second one, I would have put way more anterior into this higher quality bone instead of in the ligamentous complex. That being said, the guy's happy. He's, you know, he's bike, biking 100 miles a week, so I wouldn't have actually changed it in the end, but that's the lesson I learned from there. Uh, the second patient, 51-year-old female, another uh, Bellevue special. She works out two and a half hours every single day, um, so it's pretty nice for her. Uh, but she has this low back pain for over seven years. She says it feels like I'm pregnant. Like back when I was pregnant, it would hurt right there. I feel that same pain again. She had a uh, physical therapy for two years uh, off and on uh, in six-week sessions with three-month breaks. And she did a number of conservative measures uh, prior to it. Her PCP sent her to me. She had an epidural steroid injection. Uh, and she got minimal relief, about 3 out of 10 uh, with that. And that was her MRI, uh, showing both the axial and sagittal at that L5-S1 level. Um, she really didn't have anything there. I, she had an SI joint injection, had 100% pain relief for two weeks. Sent her off, had another SI joint injection, now had 100% pain relief for one week. So uh, we talked about what we could do. We could go do another pelvic floor physical therapy course. She really just wanted to get it taken care of. So we put in three implants uh, at that time. This is 2013. I was a little bit better at this time. It took about you know 17 minutes. So it's a fast surgery. It took about 17 minutes. We didn't have any problems. Now I went from six weeks, 50% weight bearing, down to three weeks, 50% uh, weight bearing. Those are the uh, intraop images. Uh, this is her six-month follow-up. Now I have a two-year follow-up on her. Implants look great, 90% resolution of her symptoms. Still has some pain, but now she can work out two and a half hours a day once again. That's all she cared about. Um, you know, so this is, uh, now this patient wasn't happy at first. She's like, I still have a little bit of pain. I said, well, you couldn't work out for more than 10 minutes without the pain coming. Now you can work out for two and a half hours. So what I learned is really about patient education, setting their expectations. You know, I was really gung-ho at this time thinking, well, we're gonna fix your pain. Once I told her, well, you have a little nagging pain, but you can still do everything, it took her a while to come around and understand mm -hmm. it. So it's really important to set the patient expectations with this. This is not like a micro disc where I'm going to tell them, there's a pretty good chance your pain is going to get a lot better because it just happened and it was like you know six weeks ago. Sometimes it takes some, some bit of time. It took her six months to get to 90%. Last patient, and I promise this, uh, will, this will end things. 43-year-old uh, former sales rep, uh, she had to quit her job in medical device sales because she couldn't sit in a car and uh, drive uh, to appointments because it hurt so much. Her pain started after a car accident. Uh, she had two rear-end car accidents within one month of each other. Uh, she was diagnosed with an L5-S1 herniation. She had four injections, uh, two epidurals, two selective nerve root blocks, got 0% relief, so she had a microdiscectomy done, uh, which uh, didn't make sense to me, but they tried it. Didn't get any better from that. Uh, then she had an SI joint injection by her pain doc, because then he finally saw her and said, listen, I, I don't know what they're looking for in your lower back. It's your SI joint. Now she got 90% pain relief for four days. They repeated a block only, not steroid, and she got 100% pain relief with a block. Uh, so her pain specialist, she lived in Idaho from uh, Coeur d'Alene, sent her over. 
uh, for an SI joint fusion. Uh, he sent me this picture and he also sent me a lateral so I could actually see it wasn't leaking anteriorly. MRI looked great. All provocative maneuvers matched up. Uh, once again, this is one of my earlier cases had uh, three implants. You can see the SI joint really well in that top screen uh, with the implants going across. Now, this is not the way I do it now because as I told you, this is now, this area posteriorly is more ligamentous. We want this implant to be actually up here now. So, you know, this is someone who actually did better, but I would have done it differently and moved that implant further, uh, uh, further uh, uh, dorsal. At two years, she's back to full, actually at three months, she <laughs> climbed Kilimanjaro. Uh, at nine months, she was surfing in Bali. Uh, she's gone back to full activity. There's her CT scan and she's tiny. I thought she was gonna have pain from a prominent implant. Because these implants have to be outside of the ilium for load bearing uh, purposes. So I thought she would complain of buttock pain, none. And she was like, oh, I had that at first, but that really went away. So this is another patient that, you know, rather small, there are three rather huge implants I got into her SI joint. Uh, so these are three patients I learned three different lessons on, uh, but I think it really showed the durability as well as the efficacy uh, of the treatment. Any questions? That was easy, thanks.